Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to our Sunday service. It's great to see you all here today. And to all of you watching online, many thanks for being with us. If you're on Facebook Live now, we invite you to start a watch party or share video of today's service with your friends. As usual, I hope everyone has been blessed by the good Lord in the past week. And we lift up in prayer those in our church family battling health issues or other hardships. Our church also wishes to extend its heartfelt prayers to the families and friends of the children and teachers slain in the heartbreaking and senseless shooting in Texas. We pray that God will give them comfort and healing. And we pray for an end to all school violence that takes from us the most innocent among us. time we pay tribute to and remember our service men and women who gave their lives for our freedom, just as Jesus Christ gave his life to set us free. To all our veterans who have passed before us, we owe a debt of gratitude. This morning, Anne Sadi and Raymond Carter will sing a duet with Ray leading us in hymns. After the service, we hope you'll stay for coffee hour in the Mayflower Room to enjoy a light snack and conversation. Uh, turning your attention to the bulletin, you'll notice the first announcement. The date of our last church service will be the last Sunday of June, June 26th. In the meantime, planning has begun to make this farewell service a special occasion while recognizing how hard it will be for all of us emotionally, for those who've been invested in this church for decades, primarily. But we hope it will be a time to celebrate our life as a Christian church and remember the people who contributed so much to our Congregational Church for so long. We will be inviting everyone to this service who's had a connection to the Church, members, friends, former pastors, survivors of former pastors, those who helped with our rummage and Christmas tree sales, and so on, by way of a letter in the mail in early June. In other announcements, in your bulletin, we are collecting keys to the Church, if, if you have a key or key in your possession, uh, please return your key when you can, as soon as possible, if you no longer need it for entry into the church. If you can give it to me or turn it into the office and leave a note on the desk with Liz. Um, I have the master list of who has what keys and will check off keys as they're returned. And although it's not in your bulletin, once again, I cordially invite any of you to serve as a liturgist on one of our remaining Sundays. Um, to read the opening parts of the service from our bulletin and do scripture reading. You can see Nancy or myself and let us know the Sunday of your choice or you may sign the uh, sheet, the sign sheet in the sanctuary. You won't have to handle announcements. To see the rest of our bulletin announcements, go to dccdearborn.org, click on DCC Home and then Weekly Bulletin. Or if you're on Facebook, you go to our Facebook page, look for the post promoting this service and click the links to bring up the bulletin directly. We'd like to mention a few people in our church this morning who have birthdays either just past or approaching soon. <clears throat> First, last Friday, May 27th, was David Jeffcheck's birthday. So we hope Dave had a wonderful day celebrating with his family. Coming up on Wednesday, June 1st, is Kevin Shilby's birthday. So happy early birthday to Kevin. And finally, the altar flowers today are from Carol McAdam in recognition and in loving memory of her husband, Matt McAdam's birthday, which was May 27th. Now let us worship.
please stand now for the call to worship. For God alone, our souls wait in silence, for our hope is in Him. He alone is our rock and our salvation, our fortress, we shall not be shaken. On God rests our deliverance and our honor, our mighty rock, our refuge is in God. Trust in Him at all times. O people, pour out your hearts before Him. God is a refuge for us. Let us worship the one to whom belongs power and steadfast love.
which should lead us to the realization that not only needs to be first in rank, but also first influence, or very simply, life falls apart without Jesus. You see, the premise of this book is not hard to understand. Paul simply identifies who Jesus is, and then he helps us to understand what should happen in light of that truth. So, if it is true that life falls apart without Jesus, then what should we do, think, or say to help us live with that truth in our hearts and in our daily lives? So there's three confessional statements and summaries of what we believe that throw out of the truth of this text that we learned in 17, 18. And the first one is this, I am dependent on you. The first confession that we need to make is I am dependent on upon Jesus for everything. Life falls apart when we forget we cannot make it or do anything apart from Christ. How long do you think it would take before your lives would fall apart if you didn't have Jesus? You know what Brian Sampson's problem is? Brian Sampson. <laughs> Whenever I think I can do it on my own, I fail and I can't seem to get it through this thick head of, of mine that I can't do it without Jesus. I think every single morning my challenge to you is as you're brushing your teeth, you should rehearse, Lord, I am dependent on you. Rehearse that truth over and over and over again. So then when circumstances come your way, you can say, praise God. I'm dependent and becoming more dependent on Jesus rather than waiting for circumstances to happen and you get boxed in a corner and then you say, oh Lord, I need Jesus to take the wheel. You know, that's the, that's the thing. But every morning when life is good, say, Jesus, I am dependent on you. Christ free. Verse 17 identifies that Jesus is before all things and the word means that Jesus is in front of or prior to everything that exists. Therefore, the idea simply means that Jesus is pre-existent of everything that is, and therefore everything exists by him, through him, and to him. It is a declaration of the source. In other words, there was never a time where he wasn't, and nothing exists outside or prior to him. So Christ's pre-existence implies power and authority, it makes everything else upon, dependent on him, even the father of the Jewish people, Abraham. The religious leader knew what Jesus was saying when he exerted his pre-existence. In fact, they wanted to kill him for it. So before all things means that you are God and everything depends on you. So the second thing that we learn in verse 17 is, In him all things hold together. This is a de dependency of a different kind. Jesus not, is not only the source, but he's the sustainer and the preserver of the universe. Jesus is the great unifier of the universe. Everything is held together by him. Hebrews 1.3 says this. I love this. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. How about that line of my, my fortress is our God? Anybody know what I'm going to say? One little word shall fell him. You could think of Jesus as the living link or the vital bond that holds all things together. So now we're going to have a science lesson. Anybody know anybody that likes science? <laughs> you might know what I'm going to say. I am not a scientist. But we're going to learn about something today called laminin. Anybody ever hear of that? What? Laminin? Yeah. So I'm going to play something for you.
little screen, and I'm like. I gave you all a piece of paper. Would you look at it, please? Pretty amazing, huh? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> but do you know what the image that Jesus used when he talked? He said, I'm the vine and you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. We are dependent on Christ and it's simply a matter of whether or not we acknowledge that fact and live like it. Remember that verse, the first week we studied Colossians, Christ in you, the hope of glory. We need to see dependency through a new lens, that Jesus, by definition, is the source of everything. He holds everything together. Salvation comes by dependency in Christ. Christ-likeness equals growing in dependency. It's the Spirit's role to help you be more dependent. You can do nothing apart from dependency, and God loves dependency, and there's nothing the devil doesn't like more than independence. And there's nothing that kills your soul faster than independence. It's the opposite, opposite of the physical world. What do we teach our children to do? To become mature, to do things on their own. The spiritual world is just the opposite. We are dependent upon Jesus. And we need to embrace everything that causes dependency and get on board with it. And the second thing is, verse 18, I need your power. The second confession that comes out of this text is a statement of what we need from Jesus, power. The first confession was to acknowledge and direct our hearts towards Jesus, to be independent upon him. But the second one is to realize that we're inadequate and rely on his power. Admitting inadequacy is different than asking for power. How many uh, women here have been with men driving and they're lost. Yeah. How many of the men didn't want to either turn on the GPS in these days or stop and ask for directions? And finally, after hours of driving, they say, we're lost. Get, out, get that map out and let's look at where we are. They still won't ask for directions. 
So it's a double whammy to be lost, but to be lost and then have to ask for directions is even more humbling because it, it's admitting that you need help. I was gonna tell you, <laughs> I bought this grill from Costco. It's a pellet grill at the end of the season last year. I'm all about the deal, you know, it's like probably more important to me than the product. And I, I actually, I'm, I'm not telling you the truth, my best friend in Cincinnati, Ohio said, I'm at Costco, they have two of these grills. It's $299 or $1,400. Um, you want me to get you one? And I was going down there and I said, uh, yeah, get it for me. I said, on the condition that you put it together. Because he, he can just look at something and put something together and I can't even open a ketchup bottle. And so, uh, well, I, I have my ways. <laughs> if I really want ketchup, I can get it open. Just not the right way. So he put it together for me. I went down to see him in Cincinnati, put it in the back of my Jeep, brought it up here, got it out. Well, some things happened in transit, you know, some things shook loose, whatever, blah, blah, blah. So I used it first time uh, for successfully. Second time, it, it wouldn't heat. Um, it would shut off at 105 temperatures. It's a kind of a cool grill because you just, you just, like an oven, you just put 350 and it, this, puts these pellets go in and they put enough pellets in to keep it at 350 temperature. These temperatures always even. It's very, very cool. So I, one of the things I was so excited about this grill is because it was made in the United States. It's made in uh, Louisiana. It's called Louisiana Grill. So I call the number and I get this woman on the thing and I say, she goes, what's wrong? And I said, <laughs> my grill shuts off at like 105 and she goes, what's the, what's the uh, code on it? I'm like, I don't know the code, it just, it's not heating, it shuts off at 1.5. She goes, well, there's an error code on it. She said, there's an error code. So I went out there, sure enough, there's an error code. I, I come back on the phone, and um, she's like, oh, well, that's simple. She goes, we'll just send you a new temperature probe, and you can just put that in. And I said, I don't know what a temperature probe is. And she goes, it's that doohickey on the back of your grill. You kind of have to get a flashlight to see it and find it. And she goes, you just got to take the hopper off. And there's like six screws, take the hopper off and check the auger. Make sure there aren't any pellets in the auger when you take it off. And then you just take a string and tie it around that old tempter thing. And you got to fish it kind of through the hopper. I'm like, hopper, auger, wait a minute. I don't know this. She said, oh, she said, well, I'll send you something. What's your email address? And I said, my email address is Moonstruck. Thanks for what you know. Moonstruck, I love that movie. Did you like that movie? Yes, for sure. That's one of my favorite movies. And I said, okay, just send me the email. So I get this instruction sheet that was obviously written by an engineer. I still didn't know what I was doing. So I have a gas grill. I have a company that does it. I, was, I thought, I'm going to schedule the cleaning of the gas grill. It's built in. I look him up online and sure enough, I see, praise the Lord, he is a dealer for Louisiana, Louisiana Grills. And I know him. So I called him and I said, Dwayne, I need your help. <laughs> and sure enough, Dwayne came. He said, well, first of all, you don't have the, the wheels on right. <laughs> you have to take the wheels off and put them on right. They were backwards. So he said, secondly, um, you don't have to take the hopper off. He said, this is the hopper. And in five minutes, Dwayne, who knew what he was doing, changed my temperature probe. And last night, I cooked beer can chicken. And it was delicious. But you know what? I knew I had to ask for help. I knew I needed Dwayne's power to help me. Jesus, we need his power. He's the ultimate authority. He's the true leader. He's the source of life. Hebrews 12 says he is the founder and the perfecter of our faith. He established the church. He is the one who empowers the church. Jesus one time asked Peter who he thought Jesus really was. And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, I'm a rock. I will build my church in the gates shall not prevail against it. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. As we close this building, we have to realize that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church of Jesus Christ, that he is our rock, he is our fortress, and even though this building shuts down, your souls will go on living the testimony of the gospel of Christ. Amen. And what can happen 
so great when you go to a different church if that church embraces and calls upon the power of Jesus things, Christ. Things will happen like you would not believe. <clears throat> you ever hear of a preacher named Jonathan Edwards, Congregationalist? Sinners in the hands of an angry God. Remember that? Jonathan Edwards said, So if people are being convinced of their need of Christ and led to him, if their belief that Christ appeared in history is... <laughs> God sent to save sinners, if they acknowledge that he is the only Savior and they need him desperately, if they appreciate him more than they did and love him too, we may be quite sure that it is the Holy Spirit who is at work. Jesus is the head of the church. He is the power and authority. There's more. Galatians 1.1. He's also described as the firstborn of the dead. That means that Jesus was the first who God raised from the, he was the first fruits of a coming resurrection for all who know him as a savior. He was the appetizer. In other words, Jesus' resurrection was a clear statement to the devil that sin and death were defeated. You might call it Easter power. That through Jesus' victory, his followers received the power to defeat sin and hell and death as well. So his status as firstborn from the dead means something very powerful for those who know the Savior. And here's how Romans 6 connects the dots for us. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ, Jesus, were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him in baptism into his death. In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the God and Father, that we might too walk in newness of life. You, as a Christian who have been baptized and, and died to sin, have the power, the resurrection of the power, to say no. He's the firstborn from the dead and the source of power. And it's imperative that we recognize our need to have him empower our lives. This, this is what Paul wrote about in Romans 6, 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies, to make you obey their passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those who have been brought from life to death and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. Therefore, the second cry of our hearts needs to be, Lord, I need your power that I might know him and the power of his resurrection, Philippians 4.10. The question there is rather simple. Where do you need Christ's power in your life? Is it an addiction? Because... You, can, you don't have to do it. It may be a 30-year addiction, and you can say, I can use the power that Jesus gave me through his resurrection to conquer this addiction. It may be a habit. It may be a, a, a relative or a relationship or the way you talk, but you need Christ's power in your life everywhere. You need it when you watch TV. You need it when you look at social media. You need it when you talk on the phone. You need it when you're driving in a roundabout in West Bloomfield. You need Christ's power. You need to conquer it. And you need to say no because you have the power of Christ and you will not do it without the power of Christ. He can take a simple desire that's so strong that he can make it unappetizing. He can break the enemy's power in your life, giving it new desires that you would have never had without him. He can give you the love for a spouse or a friend or a child who seems unlovable. He can give you strength to say it's faced on certain days because he lives, Teresa. He can give your words and action power that they wouldn't have on their own. He can change the one thing that no one else can change. The mm -hmm. testimonies of the resurrection is real because it changes the hearts of men and women. I've seen alcoholics give up alcohol when they turn to Jesus. Drug addicts give up drugs and benefits, all kinds of therapy. When they gave their lives over to Jesus, I've seen marriages healed with a heinous uh, uh, shape because a spouse used the resurrection power. Jesus, the full and infinite problem power. Our problem is not that he is insufficient. Our problem is we are too sufficient. Final. I need you more than anything. Verse 18. All this leads up to the final statement or confession that I want to spring from your heart in fresh and new ways. I need you more than anything. The end goal is for us to realize that depending, abiding, and trusting in Jesus is more valuable than anything else. Paul ends this 
text this morning with a simple statement that in everything he might be preeminent. The word preeminent means first rank, but it also means first in influence. The idea being that everything previously said makes Jesus worthy to have such a staggering influence. It means that Jesus takes precedence over everything else. You say, <clears throat> I'm going to tithe as soon as I get my house paid off, my car paid off. I would teach a Sunday school class. I would, but um, I don't really have a degree. I don't feel qualified. I'd be a missionary, but I'm not going to Africa. There's too many bugs and snakes. I'd rather serve you here. I'll do coffee hour every now and then. How'd that work out for you? I'll even wash the communion cups and trays. Jesus has to take preeminence in your life. Wherever you go, make him preeminent. There's a song, a gospel song by Don Walkers, and it's emotional. And he says, and when I come to die, give me Jesus. Fanny Crosby wrote the hymn, This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. So those who are trapped in your own sin and self-deficiency, I'm inviting you this week, every day, to preach to your soul every morning, whether you're brushing your teeth, you're having your coffee, for whatever. I'm dependent on you. I need your power. And I need you more than anything else. Say it with me. I'm dependent on you. I need your power. power. I need, I need you, you more than anything else. Because let me tell you, you can't do it on your own, and your life can fall <laughs> apart without Jesus.
for those of you who have children, how many times did you think you sent your child off to school, never in a million years imagining that they wouldn't come home? Our heart just grieves for those in Texas. Let's pray for the families today. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that you hold us together like the cement in a building. We're grateful for the preeminence of Christ in our lives. We're grateful for salvation that has granted us surety to approach your throne and lay before you the things that are on our heart that are troubling us. We ask that you be with the, the, those, the victims of the shooting in Texas, their families, that you'd make your presence known to them, that you would comfort them, and they would become dependent on you and receive your mercy, your grace, and the fountain of comfort. We pray for those in our body who are suffering. We pray for Polly's mother, Dolores Quick, for our sister Marilyn Beardsley, for Kaylee Graham, who was in a serious car accident, and Tracy Dodes, who continues with radiation. We pray for Marianne Cloud, for Kevin's mother, Dee Shelby, and for and, uh, Cindy Toma. We pray for Polly's daughter, Michelle Campo, for our former minister, Lou Worthington, for our shut-ins, Pat Stacko, Sue Wilson, and Kerry Goldie. We pray for our congregation, Lord, as we prepare to leave this place. We pray that you'd be with us again, wherever we choose to worship. We pray this thing in the name of Jesus, who is the head and the ruler of this church, who said this is how you should pray. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And leave us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
dependent on you. I need your power. And you're more important than anything else. Amen. Amen. Amen.